today on the show is Josephine Kinsella. She began her career in transport and travel with Transrail, Qantas, Accor, and even Skylink in Australia and New Zealand. She later became a licensed real estate agent in 2005 and quickly promoted up the ranks with Property Central, Harcourts, and Mike Perro, culminating with a CEO position at LJ Hooker in New Zealand. Josephine has had several interesting directorships on various boards, and she now heads up the Powerhouse Group, which is focusing on both the New Zealand and the U.S. markets. She is essentially a fractional CEO and customer experience director, and she's going to explain in a minute what that really means. Now, Josephine has successfully raised two daughters. They're age 13 and 16 now, and she's done all of this while balancing parenting solo while doing all these amazing roles and completing her MBA. She's also known for holding some really interesting and challenging leadership roles and project contracts, which I am 100% confident she's going to share with you about today. So would it be okay, Josephine, if we kind of started off by sharing how and why you left the transport and travel industries and how you sort of transitioned into real estate? Absolutely, Rondalyn, and thanks for having me to speak today. Look, it, it was part of a journey, really, and I, I guess I can really take it back to the people that were mentoring me back that time. I, I've had an amazing uh, fortune of having some amazing uh, leaders um, as managers, and they um, have basically picked through my persona as such and um, probably my work ethic and kind of groomed me in the direction that I was heading. So, you know, when I was at Transrail, one of the things was that the the guy there that I reported to was from aviation. And he said, look, you were just so wasted in this area. I I love working with you. I love what you do. You're a, a machine at the end of the day, you hit every target but I can just see you for bigger things. So I think from an early day, um, there was always that nurturing influence with me. Um, And interestingly, it wasn't from a a female, it was actually from a male. Um, And they were very open about where they saw my career development. So that's um, how I ended up in aviation. Um, Obviously, I, I was in aviation at a time where there was also a lot of uncertainty, which, you know, of course, we're going through in these times as well. So um, I was in a, a very Um, competitive market and the company, the organization I actually worked for, we actually had to close our doors. And I went through some very steep learning curves of uh, Qantas New Zealand, which was formerly ANSET New Zealand. Um, You know, there was some complexities in that business. And in my early 20s, um, you know, I watched a very successful company um, basically go under, which was very sad. It wasn't from the efforts of the team that I was part of. It was from some historic Um, inputs that had conflicted it, which was a a great shame. And I was fortunate to have a really good network within the aviation and the travel industry from the the airlines, which um, put me into a short-term contract in in hotels. Um, And then I was shoulder tapped to go into a private aviation company where I basically stayed uh, until Um, until my first child. So basically until I uh, was six months through uh, my pregnancy when I was pretty much forced to um, take a break from my career. And that's where, again, I had to go through a bit of a journey of change and and realize that now I had this child coming into the world and um, perhaps getting up to meet corporate jets or arranging a you know, a, a Boeing to be um, flown across the world and, you know, being in a tarmac at 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. in the morning was probably not that manageable with a, a newborn. So um, I looked at basically options then of what I could do. And I, I actually started up a, a, can you believe it, a recruitment agency from home um, and uh, started my own business. And that was great for a short period. And, and basically I got a, a competitor to tap me on the shoulder and said, um, you're tapping into so much of my market, would you consider selling? And I actually went, sure, right, write me down a figure. And if I'm open to it, I'll sell it. And that's what happened. <laughs> so um, based on that, um, the change to real estate was quite, um, can I say it was quite dramatic in terms of it was probably not something I had planned, but it was an option that I had to consider uh, due to personal circumstances. So um, at the time, um, you know, I had a newborn, um, I just sold my business, and um, I had some things in my personal life that really needed um, addressing, and that's where I got led into um, 
in real estate. I, I'd relocated to Australia um, and yeah, basically it was an opportunity that um, I knew that I could try a different approach to. So one of the things that I'd learned over my corporate life and my sales and development life, you know, through my, my younger years and the skills that I had applied, I decided I would put that into the real estate industry and try and do things really, really different. And that was probably um, back then, uh, you know, it was probably in 2005, it was probably a little bit um, forward thinking. You know, I was one of the first people to put my face on the side of the car you know, as a wrap, not as a magnet, but as a proper wrap. Um, and uh, yes, I did completely different style marketing. I was pretty in your face, very transparent, but I also had a really different style to everybody. And, and a lot of people used to make comments um, to me about that. So yeah, so that's how I moved into real estate. <laughs> what do you think it was specifically about the real estate industry that attracted you to it? Yeah, great question. For me, it was the ability to have kind of like a, a self-employment opportunity and, and it's a business within a business. So I think also the balance of it, the fact that you could have the flexibility around your family. Um, but, you know, I, I did look at the industry as kind of a little bit, um, the, the, you know, they were doing things that were a little bit old fashioned or just didn't kind of make sense as well. So my approach to how I did it was quite um, unique in in terms of how I operated with my clients, um, the hours that I worked, you know, and that was probably in some agents would probably frown upon it. But to me, it was um, just doing, you know, business in a, in a structured way and a transparent way. Um, you know, I've, I've done deals over the years where I actually haven't earned a cent from, but what I knew it was the right thing to do and what came from that, I probably earned a tenfold from it. So yeah, it was an interesting time to enter into real estate. Um, and then of course, um, I got, I was pretty um, good at, at what I did and there was that, um, that urge to take it further. So that's when I opened my own agency um, and, and that was, you know, significant investment. It was further study. Um, it was a lot more time commitment, but that was really, you know, where I like to, do, I like to focus. I, I had a passion for startups and um, growing business. So, um, yes, yeah, so I moved into that. So what were some of the rookie mistakes that you saw people making when it came to investing in property? Investing in property. Wow. Um, look, for, for me, I think even today, I still hear people going the same approach. Um, the first thing they do is they walk up the street and they go into their bank and uh, inquire on funding. And I, I don't think people realize how that affects their credit rating. You know, if I could give anybody advice on um, property investment now and getting funding, the first thing I would do is find yourself a really good broker. Um, reason being is they can tap into, um, you know, financial lending that often is not uh, thought about. And, you know, whether you're doing it from a, a personal approach or a commercial approach, you know, whether you're starting, you need to cash for starting a business or, you know, into property, um, there is other ways of, of getting funding, you know, whether it's angel investing or crowdfunding, there's, there's personal um, lenders out there that are just not the norm. And the only way to tap into them is have a really good uh, mortgage broker and that that would be something I would ask a mortgage broker about is you know who are the lenders that you're working with uh, you know first tier second tier and are you doing any private lending who is who is your network fair enough are you finding that the interest rates that are being offered by some of those private lenders were comparable to the banks I think it's more of a case of these days particularly over here in New Zealand um, and I know also sometimes in Australia is it's more the restrictions of the upfront um, investment or deposit that you need that, um, you know, controls your ability to actually raise those funds. So, you know, yes, it's going to cost you a little bit more, but you're going to get access to the funds that you actually need to make that step. And that's a big decision because, um, look, there's two approaches to real estate. And if I can take it back to when I first bought my first property, it was, you um, it was not in an area that I ever thought I would live in. Um, and, you know, it was, a, it was a property that I was going to flip. So um, that was okay. But down the track, I also learned the skill that I would buy in an area, um, not necessarily for me to live in. I would focus more on investment. And I was quite happy to rent a property that I wanted to live in. And so I think you can think a lot differently about getting on the property ladder 
Um, you need to treat it like a business sometimes. That's how you get ahead in the property market. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things I really want to focus in on is some of the experience that you had with Mike Perro. So Mike Perro, for those of you that are listening, is a brand that would be well familiar to anybody who lives in New Zealand. Um, for those of you that are listening in North America or Amer um, Australia, you, you may not have heard of him before. But why it's so interesting is that I think when you joined, he was making a transition, wasn't he, from financing loans into actually becoming a real estate agent. And you were part of that, weren't you? Yeah, so I was um, tapped, shoulder tapped. Um, initially, I, I was um, in, in a leadership for all of Harcourts and I was shoulder tapped about a year before. And Mike was, um, he had sold his finance company, his, his mortgage broking company to um, a, a larger organization. And he had this vision that he wanted to start a real estate company with a difference, but he didn't quite know how to go about it. He'd started it. The first year was, um, you know, was an interesting um, base for him to start. And he did very, like he had, he drew up a great um, vision for the company where um, he needed me. So I came on um, in the second year of the business um, and spent four and a half years in that company as the COO and, and general manager. And I, well, look, I wore lots of hats in that company. It was, it was really interesting. Um, and we took it to a different level. It was a franchise organization. Um, Mike had this vision that he wanted to grow a franchise organization completely differently, model it completely differently. Um, and I'd come in from obviously some quite um, conservative environments and franchise groups and uh, understood how they all worked. So I had that skill set there. But together, we had quite an interesting mindset of how we were going to challenge the industry and really put a, a different value proposition out there. And it was incredibly successful. Um, and on a number of areas, it wasn't just successful from uh, the consumer point of view. We brought an immense value to the market, but we had this organization that was built in just such an, a new and evolving way. Um, and, and now I see a lot of companies, you know, going this way, not necessarily in real estate, but a, a lot of um, franchise organizations are starting to reinvent the way they're structured and the value that they bring out to the franchisees. So yeah, it was a really interesting journey. I love startups. I, I just think they're the most exciting um, position to be in when you go in as a challenger brand and you do something completely different up against what we would call the, you know, the big boys. Um, yeah. And yeah. <laughs> it's, it's always fun. So um, yeah, so that was a, a great four and a half years. Now, when, when you say differently, I think you're referring to the kind of the central management franchise concept. Can you elaborate on that and just give us some insight sure. into how that came about and why it was, you know, considered so different at the time? So at the time, um, you know, real estate, uh, the industry is and probably still is to a point in, in New Zealand. I know overseas it's changing a lot, um, but there's still a mindset of you've got to have a real estate office and you've got to um, you've got to have a principal licensee for that office and you've got to have a manager and you've got to have all these overheads that pretty much strangle a business in their first three or five years. Um, or even getting that first year off the ground. If I think back to, you know, what, how I was agile in my real estate company because I was a boutique operation when I had my business and I was able to be so flexible and agile um, in the way I maneuvered. Um, so we applied those sorts of pr uh, principles to the franchise concept of, um, you know, we wouldn't require principal agents. We would actually have a team of compliance managers and a central licensee that would manage the governance and the compliance around the agency brand. And brand protection is everything out there. And where a lot of small businesses fail, um, or small business owners fail, um, is they're so busy working in the business all the time. You know, they, they let things like this slide and it's very hard to manage real estate agents and pick all the boxes legally and the governance side of it. Um, so we took that pressure away from them. Um, so we, it, it's as a way of enabling um, them to, to grow and focus on what they were there to do, was, which essentially, you know, sell real estate, um, list and sell real estate and hire people. Um, we also put in lots of systems around recruitment and very tight control. So whoever was coming into the business would actually have personal interviews with us. Um, a lot of them were either by Zoom um, or by phone call, but it was a very important 
on onboarding piece. We also had very strict induction programs. Um, again, you know, it was a requirement. It wasn't, uh, you, um, you know, oh, you, would you like to? It was you will if you're joining this company. This is the process that that happens. So we had very tight controls. Um, but what it enabled people to do as business owners was to sit back and you know, focus on the day-to-day -day stuff that needed to bring in, uh, you know, cash flow into their business. And we also had a lot of, um, you know, right down to the marketing, we took care of everything, but there was fees attached to it. They paid for every step of it along the way, uh, but at least they were getting value for their money and they were getting a return on their money. And that's important in business. Well, and one of the little known things is that about 77% of people who buy franchises are financially illiterate, have zero commercial acumen have never owned a business before so how did that work out for you in terms of you know helping them with things like their business planning and how to negotiate a lease that was going to be cost effective or work for them how, how did you manage all of that yeah so um in the early days I was very much involved in onboarding the franchisees um, in fact that was an important process so um that there was a step that they would go through from the development phase and then they would have like an interview with me and I would show them a projection sheet. Um, and I had a very, I, it's the thing I always find interesting about franchise um, organizations or, or large corporates is they come out with these very complex business planning tools or projection sheets, and they confuse the hell out of most people. So um, I took a step back and produced a very simplified projection sheet. It was a, you know, a simple Excel document. And I would literally plug in some figures, which were the, the bottom line figures of um, if you can't do this, don't come into business. And they would have all the expenses in there of their first year. So literally they could visibly see what their first year would look like and also um, their second year and their third year if, you know, if certain elements changed. And they could play with that document. So I would run through it initially and then I would send them that document. I plug in whatever figures they want so they could start to visualize their, their dream of business ownership. And there was a lot of, you know, costs in there that were just non-negotiable. So the marketing fees, the, the compliance fees, all, all these fees that helped us provide the services that they needed to be successful. Um, when it came to the leases, um, I had a very strict rule. So originally we started out as a company that actually didn't have uh, a retail presence. Well, one of the things that we realized in uh, probably year two is that we would get so much more trajectory if we had, um, so you've got two ways of growing business. You either spend it in marketing, and nowadays, obviously, you know, digital marketing is an amazing tool to be able to invest in. So, um, but back then it was more of what is your visibility out there? And in real estate, um, in the markets that we were in, that was still very tied to does the real estate agency have a street frontage or an office? I think, you know, 10, down, down the track sort of 10 years, you, you don't really need that now so much. Um, so we had this rule where I wouldn't let anyone take on a lease above 45,000. Um, and the reality was I'd, I'd done some analysis of um, successful businesses and ones that had failed. And in former organizations, I had, you know, had to be there when businesses had failed and shut their doors. So, um, you know, I was aware of the figures that worked and that didn't work through the, the trend of real estate and you know, it's very cyclical with, with real estate. So you've got to be able to weather that storm. And that's in any business, you've got to be able to weather that storm. So the leasing structure that we had in was that they would send me a copy of the proposed lease, I would always look over it, or, or somebody would look over it. Um, but the bottom line figure, I wouldn't let anyone sign a lease over 45,000. And that was really just from a, you know, weathering the storm day, if you had a bad um, six months, how are you going to pay your overheads? Um, you know, we we're really strict on that, we're making sure that people could pay their bills and stay in business and earn an income. Yeah, fair enough. Did you find that the transition from that sort of model of a centralized franchise was very different when you went to LJ Hooker in New Zealand? Oh, yes. Yeah. So um, it was interesting, you know, um, being um, tapped on the shoulder to go and run LJ Hooker. It's a completely different style and, um, you know, a certain style that's very ingrained in that organization. And again, you know, that change management piece would come in that trying to get people to understand the overheads in their business um, weren't necessarily there making the money or giving them a return. So um, it, I guess when you work with an organization that has been around so long and, you know, processes have been 
operated so long, it's it's a very slow burn with um, culture change. So, um, you know, we got some great wins and, you know, we brought in some new tools and um, started to apply, um, you know, those sorts of principles from a, that we'd used centrally into more the owner-operated um, licensee environment, which is, you know, they're responsible for their own compliance. It's still the brand that's affected, but they are still responsible. In terms of the... The business support, though, one of the critical things I I have always seen going into any organization is the lack of people's um, sitting down with a mentor and actually doing a plan and being accountable to that plan. And that's that's one thing that I've always focused on in any organization is where's your business plan? Who are you meeting with quarterly? Um, You know, how are you accountable to this and uh, and also your budgets? And absolutely. And how visual is it? You know? How visual? Absolutely. And how simple it is, because, um, you know, coming back to yeah, the, the ones I've seen over the years and other organizations were really complex. I would break it down to a simple you know, with an A3 document where I'd, I'd work with them um, on brainstorming what was in their head, put it to paper so it was visual and then help them break it down into task analysis of how they could go forward. Um, in their business and and saying as I grew the teams I would teach them how to do the same approach because it's a, it's a valuable tool if you can go into a business and help support them as a mentor like that um, and now when I coach businesses that's what we always talk about is you know let's start from the plan and um, let's let's really work out what your vision is also working at your exit strategy as well um, and people would always look sideways at me when I'd say, well, what's your exit strategy? And they're like, well, I've just, I've just opened this business. What do you mean? I'm like, I want to know how long you're in here for because I want to know what you want to get out of this business, what your expectations are, and let's put this down because you need, you need to mind map this. You need to plan it. And presumably they don't want to die in the business. They want to pass it to a, ch- a child. They want to sell it to somebody. They're, they're planning to build it for a purpose, and that purpose is that it should be worth something. Absolutely. And and the thing is where most business owners go wrong is they're still so busy working in their business, not on their business. So, you know, having that ability to, to map it out, put it on a plan and actually step back and look at it and, and work out how you can, you know, learn to delegate certain areas of the business so it's not it's not governing your life and you can get that freedom of what business ownership really should be like. You still got to work hard, but there's ways of doing it that structures it so much better to have a life from it. And speaking of having a life, you know, Josephine, a number of years ago, you had a major health scare. Would you be willing to talk about it and and also how it shaped you into the leader and the mother that you are today? Because I think the listeners will really benefit from hearing uh, your amazing story. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. No problem. Um, so, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> and look, it, it's no pressure at all. I often talk about this when I'm, um, you know, doing conference events um, because it really was a journey changer for me. So, in 2008, I was um, about to have my second child. Well, I, I was having my second child, um, and she came pretty quickly. Um, a result that um, I ended up having uh, you know, a massive blood loss incident. Um, in hospital and I was very fortunate that um, whilst they flatlined they brought me back and um, that was intri- that was a game changer on its own um, but from there I had um, probably almost uh, an area of stubbornness I think it was I was this woman who and I was 31 I was very healthy I had I never got sick I was fit I was used to balancing so many projects and businesses and motherhood and you know, being a wife at that time, that I kind of thought I was invincible. And so when they, when I came to from that incident and the doctors came in and there was quite a few of them, then they, they handed me a document and I said, oh, what's this? And they're like, we want you to have a blood transfusion. I kind of looked at them like, okay, so why are you giving me this document? And it, it, once you read it, you, it kind of terrifies you a little bit. Um, and I said, look, you know what? I'm going to be fine. I'm, I'm healthy. Um, I'll, I'll go home, I'll rest, I'll, 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 you know, balance things. I won't return to work quite so much, but, you know, I do need to leave the hospital and, and get back to um, some normality. I've got two kids to look after and, and a business and I, and, uh, I really need to go. So I checked myself out. Um, 
very silly mistake. If you're ever, you know, when a doctor says something to you, <laughs> you really do need to listen to them. They are the experts in what they do. Um, you know, they did warn me what, what could happen. And I was just very, very stubborn and, and silly. And so I went home and about 10 days later, um, they, every day, so they must have known what was going to happen because um, every day I would receive phone calls from them and a couple of visits as well, where they would phone me at like seven o'clock in the morning asking me how I was. They would check on me at, in the afternoon and also the evening by phone. So really amazing service. Um, and then on the 10th day, yeah, I, I woke up at like 3 a.m. in the morning, three or four in the morning, and I had just this excruciating pain. And um, yeah, so so when I left the hospital, I would, my blood level was at 21%, which um, apparently is pretty bad. It's you, your, your body doesn't really function that well after 20, you know, under 24%. And you, you, you do reproduce, your body does reproduce blood. And I was sort of, I knew that, you know, it's just a case of, rebuilding but I didn't realize that I still had internal bleeding anyway um long story short uh yeah I three four in the morning I was having these excruciating pains in my chest um I remembered my father who had had a series of heart attacks over the years him saying that if you ever get this feeling you you know you might be having a heart attack so lie down and position your legs up and you know you can control your breathing and your heart rate that way so I did that because at the time my husband at the time was um he'd gone out on a bender night the night before and he was completely not capable of driving me anywhere so um I didn't want to wake him how considerate of me um and so yeah I basically waited knowing that my hospital would be phoning me at seven o'clock and they phoned up and and uh, they asked me how I was. And I said, well, actually, today I'm not feeling so good. And they said, oh, what, what do you mean? And I said, well, I've got some pain. They said, whereabouts? And I, you know, I said, I, look, I've got chest pains. Um, they said, look, you're having a heart attack. Your body's shutting down. You need to get to the hospital and you need this blood transfusion. Are you prepared to do this? Uh, and I said, absolutely. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so 10 days of stubbornness um, could have completely wiped me off the planet of this earth. And, um, you know, that was a big wake up call because, you know, one thing that I realized is that my, my, um, my confidence, but my stubbornness um, had put my family in a really dangerous position. And here I was worried about my family and how they would cope without me for, you know, 10 days while I had this blood transfusion and got better. But the fact was they could have lost me in a second. And, um, yeah, it was a mind step. It was a game changer for me because it taught me I wasn't invincible. It taught me, um, you know, that even healthy people can have the most unexpected events. Uh, it also just, you know, prior reprioritized things. Um, I went from working... I mean, I still worked, you know, a lot and I still had multiple projects on the go, but I just got a lot more structured in how I did things. And I, I looked at the time that I had and just focused and everything that I ever do is, am I being agile enough in this approach? Am I being, um, am I doing it in the best way? Like it, I, I always have a focus of continuous improvement when it comes to myself, but also businesses you know is if we you know take that lens cap off and we we look from the outside in am I being the best version of me and am I maximizing the time I've got in what I do and am I really enjoying it so um, it was a game changer yeah no obviously well how do you think that this sort of you know life-altering experience because we're talking about a major you know a, a heart attack at 31 is is pretty a pretty life-changing experience so how do you think that that event and all of the things that you sort of have learned up in your career up until this point how do you think that it enables you to think differently when you approach things like growth and development and change in organizations how, how has it shaped you and changed you so prior to that event um you know, certain stress management was uh, a really interesting um, approach for me. Um, I, from that day on, I, I focused on mindfulness um, is, is one of the big game changes I, I moved into. Um, I, I just looked differently at every angle of solutions at the end of the day. I also focused around my priorities of time. Um, and from then on, I got just so much sharper and better at doing things. And the biggest thing for me was actually starting to say no. 
um, which I think a lot of oh, people what, struggle with. Talk to me about this no. What is this elusive concept? So the elusive, <laughs> I know. I hear, You know what? I hear this from so many people. Uh, I, look, it is the ability to know um, your boundaries. And I, I was very good at it even prior to um, that episode I was I was good at being very transparent with people of how I worked um, and the time that they and the value that they would get from me but in a different structured environment and I took it to the next level so there was business that I would turn away um, I stopped taking on every piece of business because not all business is good business you know that takes a certain amount of strength because in the GFC this was as well so you got a business to run you got a family to feed you got staff you know, at the end of the day, um, money is money, but you know what, not all money is worth going out there and chasing. And so, yeah, I learned to value my time and I learned to value my, you know, who my clients were as well, um, whether they really truly ex respected my value proposition and put a lot more um, worth on what my value was. You know, I think that's really important at the end of the day in business that you're not a slave to the business that you're in and you're not a slave to your customer because if if it's gone that far, then there's there's a disconnect. Um, I think you need to be really true to what you deserve out there and, and put an appropriate structure and, and be transparent from the word go. Like my clients always knew where they stood with me. They knew the res results that I would get. They knew the journey that they would go on with me. And every business I've gone into from there, I, I now uh, in the area of work that I do, which is, I'm a fractional COO and CX director. So I go into businesses and I look at the, the client journey now and I look at, the, firstly, is the client getting value for money and do they know when they're getting value for money? Because sometimes it's a lack of communication and a lack of presentation and the marketing of um, and training of the staff of you know explaining what the value proposition is. Yeah, it's it, it, it's just a very different approach. Um, and the mindfulness that we that I do I put it into my, um, it's completely holistic and my kids have been raised with, you know, mindset training as well that, you know, nothing is impossible at the end of the day. There's, that we, we can overcome anything and, you know, we'll have these bumps along the way, but the importance to stop and breathe and take a moment and reflect. And uh, that's a really important lesson that people should learn is yeah. the world is not going to blow up because um, you 10 minutes out your day or you took two days out of your week or you know whatever you just gotta sometimes look at what's really really important while you're in this yeah and our, <laughs> listeners, our listeners don't need to have an actual heart attack they can learn from the stories that you're sharing with them right now you know yeah. if, if you're sitting there in your business and you're thinking I don't have enough time to do this guess what there is always enough time to do everything that is worth doing Oh, that is so important. And I think also bouncing people, you know, ideas of people as well. I think in business, you don't spend enough time finding a mentor and working with somebody. I think it's a really important sounding board as a business owner. It is lonely in business ownership. It's lonely in leadership. And if you don't have somebody that you can go to and say, hey, I've got this idea and sometimes they will they will turn they will be quite reflective and say actually that's not a very good idea and here's the reasons why. But you need that sounding board. And if it's a, if anything I've learned over the years is you know go and invest in in a mentor or a coach or or a leadership team that will take that approach with you because it's just you know being a fractional COO that's what I do I I bounce the ideas back to the CEOs and the leadership team of when there is actually a gap or a problem. Um, it's, it's taking a different approach. You, you learn to be, um, I don't know, more, I, I would consider myself now, I'm probably more intuitive in what I've learned over the years and, and I can go in very eyes wide open and, um, you know, take a very balanced approach and sit back and listen. Like listening is the key. You like, Take time to listen to your clients, listen to your staff, listen to your partner, listen to your family, listen to your mentor, and and, and just listen to your body, right, Josephine? <laughs> oh, that too, yes. And that was a big important learning. Yeah, that was because that was my problem. I didn't listen to my body enough, and there were little warning signs that were, were telling me the whole way. Um, now I listen to everything. Kind of, I know my body very, very well, and I also, you know, I just don't take things for granted. I, you literally every day you wake up you should feel blessed 
Um, I, I've lost a number of friends over the years um, and some of them, you know, some of them through suicide, some of them through illness. And, you know, I, well, my more recent one was just a year ago. You know, one of my very good friends, I lost her. She only had a year with cancer. You know, I watched her leave behind her two children and her husband. And again, a reminder that every day we spend waking up is precious. Like, don't waste it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one of the things I want to do is I want to, in the show notes, leave everybody with some of your specific contact details, just so that it's easy for them to reach out. But if you had to, you know, let people know in a really quick nutshell what you do and what's the best way to contact you, what would you say? Okay, so what I uh, what I do now is I'm a, a fractional CEO and CX director. So I you know map out client journeys and conversation pieces within an organization, structural overviews. Um, I help coach people in different divisions. Um, and, and I help a lot of CEOs and leadership teams just identify the gaps and, and bring together their strategy. Do you I have still favorite do... industries that you like to work with, like favorite types of businesses? Uh, I'm passionate about technology, but um, also about development and construction. And, but no, there's no, um, the, the wonderful thing I've learned is don't box yourself up. I, I love being at the ability to be agile. And because I've worked in all, so many different industries, I, I can put on a, a very different approach. But um, yeah, I get some buzz out of game changing industries, I think. Um, but I also do, um, you know, coaching with just small business owners anyway. So if you want to ever reach out to me, you can. Um, contact me um, by email um, first and I'll happily get on a, a Zoom uh, meeting with you or a phone call and uh, yeah it's, it's very easy to touch base with me no matter what time zone you're in I've got I've got uh, appointments available all over the world any time zone. Fair enough well thank you so much for being a guest today and also for being so authentic and open and vulnerable with your story because I really think that I learned heaps. And I also think that it's going to resonate with a lot of people and change a lot of people's lives. So thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, it's a pleasure, Andalyn. And thank you for touching base with me. It's it's always lovely to meet a like-minded individual like yourself. Take care. Take care.